Welcome to beautiful Oregon. And the liquid sunshine is coming in droves. This is gonna be the first episode of Raven Wolf Roadshow. In this series, we'll take a look at all the special items in this location and others like this. Hey, still picking through the stone collection. And this caught my eye. There was a pile of stuff here that came collapsing down. The box on the bottom was no good. And there's this 1581, which I did notice when I came through the first time. But now we can find out if the box, ah, oh, my wrist. That's a good sign. If it hurts your wrist, you must persist. I was talking to a buddy of mine about these drives the other day, and he didn't even know this existed. I've never actually seen one in person. Get it, dude. The box looks great. The styrofoam is still stuck on this side. It's heavy. Yeah. It's a nice looking 1581. It looks fantastic. Has the usual issues with cords and foam, but other than that, it's doing just fine. I did some digging and I learned a lot about this highly sought after floppy drive. In the summer of 1987, Commodore released the 1581 floppy drive, giving Commodore VIC-20, 64, and 128 users access to the 3.5-inch drive format. Initially priced at $399, according to the sources I found online, it looks to me like it typically sold for about $200, as you can see in this advertisement from the September 1987 magazine. The drive could even be ordered directly from Commodore for $249.95 as early as December 1987, which is only six months after it was released. This example is in the box and is complete except the warranty card. It exhibits an interesting issue commonly seen in vintage computers. The cables have reacted with the styrofoam packaging, binding to them and leaving a nasty residue on all the cables that needs to be cleaned off. This is why we recommend that cables always be stored in a plastic bag to prevent this kind of damage. In some cases, the cables can even react with the computer's case, causing severe and sometimes permanent disfigurement. The 1581 didn't get widespread distribution because very little software was distributed in the 3.5 inch format for the 64 and the 128. Because even when people had a 1581, they also virtually always had a 5.25 inch drive as well. So it didn't make a lot of sense to distribute software in this format when the one format would do for everything. But still, the 1581 found its niche. It was useful to read PC discs using software like this Big Blue Reader package. It was also popular with bulletin board sysops and other users who needed a large amount of data available at one time due to its, for the day, very high capacity of 800K per diskette. Because the 1581 used a custom MFM format, it was only compatible with older drives at the operating system level, which is another issue that hampered its adoption. Interestingly, the 1581 had a 2 MHz 6502 processor, making it faster than many of the computers it was connected to. It also had 32K of ROM and 8K of RAM. The 1581 used Commodore's proprietary IEEE 488 serial connection, and as such, was the highest capacity drive ever released by Commodore with that connection and the only three and a half inch one. There were higher capacity aftermarket drives like the Creative Micro Devices FD2000 with 1.6 megabytes per disk capacity. And as I have here, an FD4000 with a whopping 3.2 megabytes per three and a half inch diskette, which is the largest I have ever heard of for the day. <laughs> These drives have a better low level compatibility to boot. Shortly after Commodore released the 1581, it had to recall them due to a high failure rate. Commodore had received a bad batch of WD-1770 disk controllers from its vendor. These controllers had the bad habit of corrupting the directories on the diskettes and caused weird behavior on the drives like trying to read a floppy without spinning it. The recalled drives had the bad 1770 controllers replaced with WD-1772s. Because there had only been one bad batch of WD-1770s, there's still plenty of drives out there with that chip in it that work just fine. One nice feature of the 1581 is that it had an external power supply. 
This made it smaller and run cooler than many of its predecessors. Commodore eventually discontinued the 1581 in 1990, making it a fairly short-lived product for the day at only three years. I was really happy to get a look at this original drive. I have several other Roadshow videos in the works, and I'll link them here when they're ready. In the meantime, you might like this video where I saw the stone collection in its natural habitat for the first time, including this disk drive. 